Well, if you have been with us, uh, you know that since Christmas, really, we've been in the book of Esther. Esther has 10 chapters. We're going to make it all the way to the end today. Uh, so far, I, I think you'd agree we've covered a lot of ground uh, theologically and historically. We've looked at uh, the Persian Empire. We've looked at life in exile for the people of God. We've looked at uh, certain theological concepts like the providence of God, the wrath of God. Uh, we've seen the deliverance of God, where he saved his people from their enemies. And today, uh, what we're going to do is see how God's people in that time, they remembered and celebrated all the amazing events of the story. Uh, in fact, what we're going to see today is the beginning of a Jewish holiday called Purim which began in the time of Esther and continues to this very day. In fact, uh, Purim was celebrated just a few weeks ago. February 25th was Purim 2021 for the, the Jews in the world. They celebrated. And in case you're wondering what that looks like, I've got a few pictures. Uh, this isn't from this Purim, but this, this is from, you know, they'd been having masks if it was from this year. But I hear some dancing in the street in London. Uh, this is the kind of celebrations that go on at the time of Purim. This is a photo from uh, Jerusalem. You can see it's a, it's a massive party. I mean, this is a big celebration that continues on to this day. And so this morning, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the root of this festival and seek to understand not just Purim, but also the importance of remembering and celebrating as the people of God. So we're going to begin uh, right after the victory. That happened last week, the big victory, they defeated their enemies, and uh, it's an amazing uh, victory that kind of spontaneously erupts into celebration. So I'm going to begin in verse 16 of chapter 9, uh, which reads um, this way. Verse 17, this was on the 13th day. Now this means the victory. The victory was on the 13th day of the month of Adar, and on the 14th day they rested, that's the people of God, and made that a day of feasting and gladness. But the Jews who were in Susa gathered on the 13th day and on the 14th and rested on the 15th day, making that the day of feasting and gladness. Therefore, the Jews of the villages who live in the rural towns hold the 14th day of the month of Adar as a day for gladness and feasting, as a holiday, and as a day on which they send gifts and food to one another. So we'll pause there for a minute. Um, you can see there a lot of gladness and feasting. Three times it's mentioned, feasting and gladness, feasting and gladness. Um, you can understand why they were so excited. This past year for the Jewish people has been a tough one. I mean, you think our year has been difficult with COVID. Uh, their year, part of the year was spent uh, fearing for their lives because uh, a decree of death was handed out. And so they were just waiting for the end of the year when they were all going to be probably annihilated. And then another part of the year was spent preparing for battle. When they got the word, the second decree said, you can fight back. So they all of a sudden had to figure out, do we have weapons? Do we even know how to fight? Do we have? So they got themselves ready. So the stress level coming into the 12th month, the 13th day, was very, very high. And now after the battle, after they've won, they, you can imagine the relief that they felt. And it just overflowed into joy and celebration. Of course it did. That, that, of course that's what happened. But next we're going to see that Mordecai looks around and recognizes, hey, this, this can't just be a one-time thing. That there is, there is reason to celebrate here. In fact, we should do this every year. And so Mordecai does what uh, I think the people in Persia seem to do all the time, which is to write a letter. And they send it throughout the empire. If you think about the story, that's what happens over and over and over again. So now Mordecai writes a letter saying to all the Jews, we, we got to do this every year. Uh, here's how it reads, verse 20. And Mordecai recorded these things and sent letters to all the Jews who were in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus, both near and far, obliging them to keep the 14th day of the month, Adar, and also the 15th day of the same year by year, as the days on which the Jews got relief from their enemies and as the month that had been turned for them from sorrow into gladness, from mourning into a holiday, that they should make them days of feasting and gladness, days for sending gifts of food to one another and gifts to the poor." So this really is the beginning of the Feast of Purim. Um, if you're wondering why there's two days, it's because, remember, Esther asked for uh, an extension to the battle. So in the capital city, uh, they had the one day that was the day of battle, but then she said, can we do one more day? So that means that in the surrounding area, most of the empire, they celebrated on the, on the 14th, but uh, in the capital, they celebrated on the 15th. And actually, even to this day, Purim is kind of celebrated over two days. Uh, most of the Jews this year celebrated on February 25th. But if you lived in a walled city, like the city of Jerusalem, you would have celebrated on the 26th. So kind of two days for Purim. Uh, the components of the celebration are pretty simple. Feasting and gladness. There's been a lot of feasting in this book, so that seems fitting that they would throw a big feast. Giving of gifts, 
which also is pretty fitting because the whole point is to celebrate God's goodness, his provision in their lives. Uh, something that's not mentioned directly in the text, but it's de- developed over time, is the tradition of reading uh, the, the book of Esther, the story of Esther. They read it on Purim Eve, and then also, once again, on Purim during the day. And they don't just read it. Over the years, it's become kind of an interactive thing. Uh, when they read the name of Mordecai, everyone in the audience says, his name be blessed. They kind of, they, they get excited because he's the hero. And when they read the name of Haman, everyone says, his name be cursed. And they stomp their feet and they have, here's a picture. They have these noisemakers that they bring into the synagogue and um, they, they rattle them. They want to drown out the name of Haman because it's a vile name. So it's a very uh, boisterous kind of a thing. Um, the other thing that's happened over the years is this call to gladness has really, uh, I mean, it's really been uh, accentuated. For, um, for many people, actually, they, they now call uh, Purim the Jewish Mardi Gras, is kind of what they say. They dress up in costumes. So here's some costumes. Uh, these kids are, are dressing up in Purim costumes. They're dressing up as old Jewish people, I think, which is kind of fun. Um, this other photo is someone wearing a chicken costume for reasons that are, are not really clear, but they're dancing in the street. Um, the other thing that is part of uh, Purim is a lot of drinking. Uh, over the years, uh, the rabbis have instructed that men celebrating Purim should drink. In fact, uh, Rabbi Reva has said that um, you should drink so much that you can't tell the difference between Haman be cursed or Mordecai be blessed, which I'm guessing is a lot. So it's that kind of a party that has developed. Uh, if you're wondering why this celebration is called Purim, Uh, We get the answer in the next few verses, okay? So here's verses uh, 23 to 26. Here's how it goes. So the Jews accepted that uh, that they had started to do and what Mordecai had written to them. And then there's a bit of a summary of what they're celebrating. For Haman the Agagite, the son of Hamadatha, the enemy of all the Jews, had plotted against the Jews to destroy them and had cast pure, that is, cast lots, to crush and destroy them. But when it came before the king, he gave orders in writing that his evil plan that he had devised against the Jews should return on his own head and that he and his sons should be hanged on the gallows. Therefore, they called these days Purim after the term pure. Now, there's a couple of things that are a little strange about this. Uh, you may have noticed the summary of the story. It sure makes it seem like the king is the one who saves the day, which is a bit odd. There's no mention of Esther or Mordecai or God. Uh, which, is, which is odd seeing as how this is the Jews writing this to the other Jews. you think they would have mentioned uh, Mordecai. But scholars uh, think that this is probably kind of like a cleaned up public version of the story. Because remember, uh, they're writing this uh, in the Persian Empire. It's, a, it's probably a good idea that the king thinks the celebration is maybe a little bit to do with him. Uh, the other thing they note, though, is in the, in the writing of the letter, it doesn't actually say the king's name. So the idea here is that when the Jews were to read what they're to celebrate, uh, the Persians might think, oh, they're celebrating King Ahasuerus, but the Jews would know that they're celebrating the King of Kings, the real king who intervened, God himself, to help them. The other thing that's a bit strange is the name. Because if you think about it, Purim, the the casting of lots that Haman did, um, where the name comes from, is a very minor part of the story. I mean, you would think maybe that they would call this Mordecai Fest or... Esterpalooza, but I like that one. Uh, but, but no, in fact, they call it Purim, and uh, it, this, is, this is still helpful for the Jews. In fact, this is still on point, because the name, the name really gets to the crux of the issue of how you read the book of Esther. The temptation, as we've seen in reading through this, is to think, look, this, there's a lot of coincidences in this story. The reason that things go well is, is luck, right? This, the Jews were lucky, the things just happened, boy, that, that's great, but in fact, that's, that's not what is true. That's not what we believe. And so the name reminds everyone that the destiny of God's people uh, was never left up to chance and, and was not determined by someone like Haman rolling the dice. God and God alone determined the lot or the Purim of his people. And so for the Jewish people hearing the name Purim, they would know this is, this is again pointing to God. He is the one who delivered us. He is the reason that we are celebrating and in the next section, we see kind of the, them formalizing this, them obligating themselves, committing themselves to celebrating this year after year. So uh, here is verses 26 to 28. <clears throat> Therefore, because of all that was written in this letter and of what they had faced in this matter and of what had happened to them, the Jews firmly obligated themselves and their offspring and all who joined them that without fail they would keep these two days according to what was written 
and at the time appointed every year, that these days should be remembered and kept throughout every generation in every clan, province, city, and that these days of Purim should never fall into disuse among the Jews, nor should the commemoration of these days cease among their descendants. So very, uh, very clear indication that this is going to happen every year. And in fact, uh, that has pretty much been the case. As I said, up to this year, there's still celebration. Uh, the next little bit, Queen Esther kind of endorses the celebration as the queen, but she also gives us a little bit more context. Uh, so here's uh, 29 to 32. Then Queen Esther, the daughter of Abihail and Mordecai the Jew, gave full written authority, confirming the second letter about Purim. Letters were sent to all the Jews to the 127 provinces of the kingdom of Hashuerus in words of peace and truth, that these days of Purim should be observed at their appointed seasons as Mordecai the Jew and Queen Esther obligated them and as they had obligated themselves and their offspring with regard to their fasts and their lamenting. The command of Esther confirmed these practices of Purim and it was recorded in writing. Now what we notice there, which is interesting, is when Esther sort of frames things, she says basically to the people, look, in the same way that you committed yourselves to fasting for me, remember back when Esther was about to go to the king and she asked everyone to fast for three days, she says, with the same conviction, because they were very, I mean, they were worried then. Their hearts really in it. They were fasting before the Lord. And she's saying, in that same way now, we are going to feast. We're going to celebrate with that same level of, of commitment. And in fact, to this day, the Jews will fast on the day before Purim. So that, that dynamic is still involved there. Okay, this brings us to chapter 10, the very last chapter of Esther. Uh, just three verses. So uh, here we go. Here's the ending. King Hashuerus imposed tax on the land and on the coastlands of the sea and all the acts of his power and might and the full account of the high honor of Mordecai to which the king advanced him. Are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Medea and Persia? For Mordecai the Jew was second in rank to King Hashuerus and he was great among the Jews and popular with the multitude of his brothers for he sought the welfare of his people and spoke peace to all his people. So the book ends with a statement of peace. It's, it's a happy ending. A happy ending to a story that was filled with a lack of peace, filled with, with trial and tribulation for the Jewish people. Now we see this promise of greater peace for the people of God in a land that has been very hostile to them over the years. So what we're going to do, uh, as we've kind of done throughout the, the series, is we are going to look and um, highlight some truths that we find in this particular text things that were true for God's people at the time, and then take them and, and see how they are also true for us. Those who are watching, who would consider ourselves a person of God, a Christian, seeking to follow him, how can we be faithful in light of this text? What, what is helpful for us here? So we're going to find three truths, three truths from the book of Esther, and here's the first one. We see in this text that we should genuinely celebrate God's work in our lives. Genuinely celebrate God's work in our lives. Uh, one of the things that the Jewish people really knew how to do was to remember and celebrate what God had done. Uh, this, this celebration of Purim is not the first one. In fact, it comes at the end of a long list of celebrations. If you look at the Old Testament Jewish calendar, it's totally organized around feasts. Uh, there's a Feast of Weeks, for example, that celebrates the harvest. It, it gives thanks to God that he provided for his people once again. There's the Feast of Booths which remembers the time when God's people wandered through the wilderness and God provided for them. There's, of course, Passover, which remembers God, God's salvation, saving them out of Egypt. There's the Day of Atonement, the Feast of Trumpets, and now the celebration of Purim. And the thing to recognize if you think about this number of feasts and celebrations is that all of them took a lot of time and planning and energy and money to make them happen. In fact, in the Old Testament, uh, there was an added uh, tithe, a percentage that was added on to the regular tithe and that money would just go towards the festivals, just so they could make sure they, they could fund the festivals. And they did this not just because they wanted a party. They, they, did, they did it because it was a very practical and meaningful way for them to genuinely remember and rejoice in all that God has done. And the lesson we should take from this is that this, this should still be happening in our lives today as the people of God. I remember when I first came on staff at Westside Church, um, it was the staff Christmas party, very first staff Christmas party we went to. And Don and I were there at, uh, I think we were at a restaurant in Granville Island. And uh, Pastor Norm, Norm Funk, was the lead pastor there, and he stood up. I remember him saying, uh, tonight we are going to feast. 
We are going to eat very well. We're going to celebrate. He said, because uh, as Christians, we should be known for fasting. There are times when we fast, we humble ourselves before the Lord, we remind ourselves that God is all we need. But there are other times when we feast. And the reason we feast is because we actually have a lot to celebrate. That when people look at our lives and they see us fasting and then feasting, it tells, a, it tells them something about us. And, and his point was that it's not honoring to God to have a life that's reserved and dour and stingy, like Scrooge McDuck, right? Never wanting to spend any money, never wanting to make too much of a big deal about things. That's, that's, that shouldn't mark us as Christians. As people of God, people should see us and be like, man, they party a lot. Why are they so happy all the time? Why are they celebrating again? So that's true, and we see it is here. I mean, there's a lot of gladness, a lot of feasting in Persia at the time. The question we might ask then, if all of those feasts and celebrations from the Old Testament were sanctioned by God for the people of God, why don't we celebrate them anymore? Like a few weeks ago, why didn't we have a Purim celebration? And the answer, the answer is that those festivals have been replaced by an even greater reason to celebrate. And of course, I'm talking about the cross of Jesus. Now the people of God, Christians, we, we do celebrate, but the, the thing, the person we celebrate is Jesus. Jesus, our Savior, who didn't just conquer our earthly enemies, but defeated Satan and death on the cross. Jesus, the, the Prince of Peace, who didn't just bring earthly peace, temporary peace like Mordecai did, which is great, but he brought us eternal peace with God himself. We celebrate Jesus, the Messiah, who did not remain hidden, working in a way that we cannot see. He revealed himself as the Son of God so that we might worship him. Our year now revolves around celebrations of Jesus, Christmas and Easter. When we celebrate those properly, they remind us of the greatest display of God's grace and power and love, which is is why we rightly should make a big deal about both of those celebrations. But it's not just Christmas and Easter. There's another thing that we've been given to remember the cross and remember Jesus, and that is a communion, the Lord's table. That's what it's all about. The cup and and the bread, they point us back to Jesus, the, the, the juice, the wine reminding us of the blood of Christ poured out for our sins, the bread reminding us of his body given for us, sacrificed for us. And Jesus said we're to do this in remembrance of him. And I'm not sure about you, but one of the toughest things, one of the things I've missed the most about this that we're doing right now, this, this hindrance from gathering together physically is not being able to celebrate communion. I've been longing to be able to be with God's people and, and celebrate and remember together. And um, I want you to stay tuned uh, next week because we have some ideas about how we can make that happen again this Good Friday that I'm very excited about um, because it is something that should mark us as Christians that we remember, that we celebrate, that we, that we do these things together. But the point that I want to make here today and that we see in our text is that we actually do have a lot of opportunities to celebrate and remember Jesus. Some of them are formal celebrations. Other of them are more informal. The the things that just pour out of our mouth when good things happen. Praise God. Praise Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done. The question I think we need to be asking ourselves in light of the the magnitude of the celebration here from these Jews is, is our lives, are our lives marked by this kind of celebration? Like if people who know us, if they look at us, would they be struck by kind of a pattern of us celebrating and rejoicing in what God has done? Because the thing about festivals and celebrations and, and remembering is that you can forget to do them, but you can also do them in a way that's, that's more of a habit. I mean, that's why I added the word genuinely to our, to our first point here. I said we are to genuinely celebrate God's work. That word genuinely that you you see there in the point is there because because it's possible to do it in a way that's that's very superficial. I mean, it's possible to to get to the end of Christmas and to feel all warm and tingly. And all you've done is had a great meal, got some great gifts, spent time with your family, had a day off, and you feel like, man, that was was a great Christmas. I feel fantastic. And you, you haven't actually celebrated the reason for Christmas. That happens all the time. We can blow through Easter weekend and be thankful for a day off and not actually stop and and celebrate. It's it's in our nature, our sin nature, to focus more on the festivities rather than the reason behind them. 
And this is especially applicable for us right now because it's the season of Lent. And, and the question we maybe should be asking ourselves is, have we been preparing our hearts for the celebration of Easter? Have we been setting aside time, extra time each day? Maybe to read through the devotional book we set out or portions of scripture. Have we set aside time maybe for fasting, extra prayer? Have we been preparing our hearts to really celebrate when Easter comes? Because the thing that I know about us as human beings is, is that celebrations work best when we prepare for them. Think about anniversaries. Um, some of us maybe can remember just, you know, when we were married all, all the time and make a big deal of it. Most of us, most of us need a reminder in our calendar a few weeks out because if we're really going to celebrate this, we want to make dinner reservations, might want to order flowers, might want to get a nice shirt, we want to, we want to do certain things so that when a, our anniversary comes, we can, we can go and genuinely celebrate. And all the preparations, it's not artificial, it's not like us just saying, well, I guess I have to do that. Hopefully, really what it's us is saying, honey, this, I'm so thankful for you. I love that we're married. I love being married to you. I want to set aside time and energy and resources so that you know and that we can celebrate what God is doing in our marriage. It's the same thing when we celebrate the Lord. We need to prepare our hearts. We need to be in the, the, the story. We need to be fostering a sense of affection and excitement in us, something that can grow cold over time if we're not careful. So, in light of what we see here, of the, the gladness and the feasting, again I ask, is, is our life marked by the celebration of Jesus? In Susa, think about it, everyone was very clear about what the Jews were happy about. I mean, they were looking in the streets, people were dancing, they could tell that something great had happened. Can people tell that about us? That something great has happened in our lives? We should genuinely celebrate God's work in all sorts of different ways. Second thing, second truth. We are still in exile. We are still in exile. See, with all the feasting and gladness in this last section, it's easy to forget that the context of the story for the Jews really has not changed. They're in exile. They're still far from home. Even those who did go back to Jerusalem are still under Persian rule. And we get this in our text from just a tiny little part. Just look at chapter 10, verse 1. It says this. King Ahasuerus imposed tax on the land and on the coastlands of the sea. Which seems like a weird thing in all of the feasting to, to introduce. And by the way, the king, you know, taxed the people. It's not a good thing. It's not clear why he did this. It may have been a reinstatement of the tax that he took back when Esther was made queen. We're not sure, but here's the point. The point is, yes, yes, the Jews experienced a great victory. Yes, their man Mordecai is now second in command, but, but they are still under Persian rule. They are still subject to a king who is impulsive, self-indulgent, greedy, and he still needs money because he's got some more feasts to throw. He wants to build some more stuff. And so the reminder here, just kind of a bit of perspective, is yes, the Jews are celebrating, but, but remember, they, they are still subject to Persian rule. They are still in exile. And that should be a reminder for us that the same is true for us. Yes, we have experienced God's deliverance to an even greater extent with the cross. Yes, we have had ultimate victory over Satan and sin through Jesus. He defeated them on the cross. We've been adopted into the family of God. So many reasons to celebrate, but but we aren't home yet. We still live in, in enemy territory. The devil still prowls around like a roaring lion. Our own sin conspires against us. Our, our faith is threatened in many, many ways because of where we are, because we are not yet in, in heaven. And it's not just the attacks, like the hard things in our life that threaten our faith. It's also the comforts. I mean, we've seen through this book if you think about all the, the different times that there's been a real pressure on the Jewish people, on Esther herself, to compromise. The, the Jews who've remained in Susa in particular, they've been really pressured to start to think and live like the Persians, to compromise their values, compromise their traditions, and just to live like everyone around them. And we need to recognize that because we are still in exile in this world, the same pressures exist for us. It's very possible for us to live in such a way that we really... We really feel like this world is our home. 
We begin to think like the world, to value the same things as the world, and to invest in the world. And yet what we see in Scripture very clearly from Jesus is that that's not how we should think of ourselves, our relationship to the world around us. He says in John 17 that we're to be in the world but not of the world, meaning our identity is not tied to what we see here and now. And James 4.4 says this, Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. You see the danger there of being a friend of the world. Now, it's not saying you can't have friends, right? Don't go and you know, phone up all your friends. I can't do it. Slam down the phone. What it's saying is you, 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 shouldn't, you should be careful about how much you're attached to the world. Because when you're a friend with someone, a good friend, you open up your heart to them. And if we're opening up our heart to the world, aligning ourselves with the world, then it's going to have an impact on our faith. Because if we tie ourselves to the things of this world, then what happens when the things that we experience in life get harder, get more difficult? What happens when our health is failing, when our finances collapse, when relationships fall apart, when the things that we're in, enjoying right now and finding comfort in, when they're taken away, if, that's, if our heart is tied to those things, our faith is going to falter. We're going to become angry. We're going to become bitter. We're going to start to doubt God's goodness because how can he allow those things if he really loves us? There's a problem when we tie ourselves to the world. So the question is, well, how do we do that then? How do we live faithfully in this world with the understanding that we are in exile. Some Christians have the idea that, well, probably the best thing would be then to separate ourselves from the world, right? There's some land we can find somewhere, put up a fence, build a commune. We can just live out there and not be tainted by the world. Of course, that's a problem because Jesus, before he left, said, look, I want you to go and teach everyone all I've commanded, which means we need to know people and be in the world. That's what he said. Go there, spread the gospel. You need to be effective to reach people. We need to love the world and yet not tie ourselves to the world. How do we do that? Well, he gives us a framework. It's very helpful. Here's 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 29 to 31. Paul is speaking here to the Corinthian church. He says, The appointed time has grown very short. From now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no goods, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the present form of this world is passing away. What does he mean there? Does he mean that we should treat our wives as strangers? Show them no affection? No, of course not. Does this mean we should rebuke those who are mourning or those who are rejoicing and tell them, look, don't forget, your home is in heaven. Don't be too sad. Don't be too happy. No. No, we're told in Scripture, we're to mourn with those who mourn, rejoice with those who Rejoice. Are we to stop buying food? Stop having any business dealings in the world? No, of, of course not. We're to be in the world for the good of the world. So, so what does it mean? What it means is we do all of these things, but we do it in such a way that our greatest affections are for Christ. We do it in such a way that we are engaged with the world, but our heart is not tied to the world. Because while everything we see around us may seem very tangible and good and, and strong, the truth is that it will all pass away. This is God's love for us. He wants for our hearts to be guarded, for our faith to be strong. And he knows that if we, we grab on tight to the things around us, even, even good things like our, like our wives or our spouses, then, then our faith is going to suffer. What we need to do is put Christ first. Grab on most tightly to him and then enjoy the blessings he's given us and endure the hardships because of the faith we have in him. This may sound kind of theological or intellectual, but it's very practical. It's very practical because think of, think of the Jews at that moment. They're celebrating, they're excited the next day, taxes. And they're like, what? God, I thought you were blessing us. It's like up and down, up and down. That's, that's the mark of someone who, who doesn't remember they're in exile. People in exile, we expect things to go up and down. But, but our hope, our emotions, our faith does not go up and down because it's tied to something that is secure. It's tied to heaven and to Christ himself. So the instruction here, reminder here for us, is let's not forget that we are still in exile, but our home is in heaven. And we have the assurance that we will be there because of Christ. Okay, last thing. Third truth. One day, 
One day we will see the full beauty of God's work in our lives. The full beauty of God's work in our lives. The wonderful thing about finishing a good story, I think, is that you can look back on the story and you can see uh, all the things that the author was doing to weave together this story so that uh, it came to a great ending. We, we, we see here in Esther the full beauty of the ending. It, it's a wonderful thing. It's, I don't know about you, it's why I love uh, good books. It, it's why I've always loved reading. It's why I studied English in school because I, I love sitting around with a bunch of other English nerds and talking about a novel or a play and, and seeing the connections and being able to, wow, the, the author did this and that and it comes together in a, in a beautiful way. It's fantastic. The thing, though, that I've realized about English literature is that there are a lot of good pieces of literature that are very difficult to understand. There's a lot of times when there's something that is a masterpiece, apparently, but to read it and understand it is very difficult. Uh, I remember taking a, a class on John Milton, who wrote one of the most epic poems ever, Paradise Lost, which is about Adam and Eve and their fall into sin. It's fantastic. It's amazing. I remember, though, when I got it and I was reading it, we have to read it at home and then you you go into class. But at home, I was like, wow, this is uh, hard to read. I, it was hard to understand. And I kind of got some of it, and I pretended like I found it really amazing. But I, I didn't quite understand all the parts. But then in class, the prof, who studied a lot, he took us through all of the references, all of the language, all of the wording. And by the end of class, I was like, wow, this is amazing. This is a beautiful piece of work. That's often how things work. Even beautiful things are tough to appreciate in the moment. And I would say that's what we see here in Esther. I mean, for us reading, there would be times when we would say, this, this does not look beautiful, this does not look good for God's people. You can imagine what it was like them living it, seeing that decree from Haman, when in whatever many months, nine months, you're all going to be destroyed. That is not a beautiful day. That's a horrible day. It's difficult. would have been difficult for them to see the good that God is doing in their lives in that moment. By the end, though, by the end, they could see and we can see the beauty of what God has done. They can see how all the events of the story of Esther come together to form something that is beautiful and spectacular. They can see the wonder of God as he reveals himself, even though he's hidden. They can see the power of God to sovereignly orchestrate all the details of, of circumstances of things that people didn't even know needed to happen, like the king having an insomnia. And they can see the vivid picture of the battle that we are called to wage against evil and the ultimate deliverance of God. See, when I think of the book of Esther and, and here at the end of it looking back, what it really makes me long for is the day when I will see Jesus. Because when we see Jesus in, in heaven, it's, it's not just the joy. I mean, it will be the joy of being in heaven. But it will also give us a greater clarity, a greater perspective about our lives that we will be able to, to look into the face of our Savior and then also look back on our lives and see all the things that he was doing all along the way. And the reason I say that is because of, because of this verse. Again, 1 Corinthians, uh, this chapter 13, verse 12, Paul says, For now, like now in this world, we see in a mirror dimly, but then in heaven face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully even as I have been fully known. What he's saying here is, look, right now, when we think about our lives, we think about the reality of the way we're living, it, it's kind of like we're looking into one of those um, mirrors from the public washrooms at the park. You know, it's not even real glass or mirror. It's like kind of mottled metal. It's all scratched up. It's really hard to see ourselves. He's saying that's, that's kind of what it's like now, to try to look around and understand who we are, what God is doing. We can see some things, but it's really hard to see the big picture. But in heaven, in heaven, we will be able to see everything perfect. We'll be able to understand ourselves perfectly. Not, not fully, like not like we're going to be God and know everything, but we're going to have the clarity of heaven. And that means then there will be a day when we can look back on our life and we can see all of the instances where we were confused, where we were upset, where we were in despair, not knowing what God was doing, and we can see how even in those things God was at work. And the thing that would be most clear of all, I think, to us is that even though there were times, like we've seen here in the book of Esther, when God has seemed hidden, the truth of the matter is that God is always with us. That every moment of every day, 
He is with us. He is working for our good and for his glory. And I can't wait for the day when I can see all that clearly. Right now, by the grace of God, as we draw near to Jesus, we can see some of that. He does allow us. He gives us glimpses. Right? You look back on certain parts of your life, and, and at the time it was so confusing, and yet now, five years later, you look back and say, oh, Lord, I see what you're doing. I praise you for what you were doing in that difficult time. That will be times a million. We get into his presence, and we're able to rejoice in all that he's done, and we will see that Jesus has been faithful to us every single moment of our lives. It will give us even more reason to celebrate and remember, and here and now, because we get glimpses, we can still celebrate. In fact, my hope is that in light of what we see here in this, in this book, this, this sometimes difficult story that has a great ending that we will remember, that is the story of our lives. There will be difficulties. There may still be difficulties to come, but in the end, there will be so much reason to rejoice. And that means we can celebrate and remember even now because all that was needed to be done for us to have hope has been done by Jesus. He has been faithful. He has never left us. We can praise him for that. Let me pray for us. And then we'll praise him together as we worship. Lord Jesus, I do thank you for the story of Esther. Thank you for your deliverance of your people back there in that day. I thank you, Lord Jesus, because here and now we have the, the, the same reason, even more reason to rejoice. That Jesus, you are at work for our good in every single thing. You did go to the cross and defeat the enemies that threaten us. And you do preserve and protect our faith. I pray, Lord Jesus for those who are struggling right now, for whatever it is, circumstantial difficulties, God, I pray you'd help them. Help us to remember that, that this life we're living now is temporary, that we have a home waiting for us in heaven. And Lord Jesus, that even in the midst of the difficulty here, you are, you are creating something beautiful in us, something that is for our good and is for your glory. And so I pray that would encourage us and Lord, that we as a people would be marked by celebration celebrating the goodness that you've brought into our lives. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.